to pick me, like I said, the revitalization of traditional tattooing, um, Yupik, Inuit, and um, Inupak tattooing. Uh, I thought we'd start with a little bit about each of us and how we got involved, and then we'll talk tattooing. Um, so I, Holly Mititkuk Nordlam, is a I'm a visual artist from Kotzebue, and um, I have work here at the museum. I've done a lot of work with the museum. Um, I graduated from UAA, grew up in Kotzebue. Um, there I go again, Trevor. And um, I own Manic Design, a local design, graphic design company. Uh, this is just typical of how we grew up. And now that I look, I mean, every time I look at this picture, and I've shown it before here, I think um, I look so Scandinavian <laughs> and not in fact. But um, this was at camp. It's just 30 miles uh, away from Kotzebue, actually. And I spent many years there. Um, no running water. Um, we actually hauled water from the creek um, and ran dogs. My parents were dog mushers. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, to pick me, uh, tattooing for um, tattooing in indigenous culture, especially Inuit Inupak, was about women. And I want to talk a little bit about strong women in my life um, as they kind of will um, help you understand why I'm interested in tattooing. So this is my mother, Lucy Nordlam. Lucy uh, lives in Kotzebue still and um, spends almost 50% of her time in, at camp and hauling water still and, um, you know, four-wheelers, snow machines. It's, it's a little bit tougher life than we have here. And I just want to mention that um, she was an amazing dog musher and an amazing sports person. She is a, an amazing sports person. She was Rookie of the Year in the 89 Iditarod. She finished the Yukon Quest. And um, she's just an amazing human being, strong amazing human being. And this is a picture on the beach in Kotzebue, and the woman standing, the younger woman standing, is my Anna, Annie Schaefer. Um, she had 13 boys, big family. Um, she processed food. She worked at the school. She was another strong, amazing woman. And then the woman standing next to her is my Anamo, which means great-grandmother. She, her name was Lucy, also Lucy Schaefer, Sakolin. And um, she had the uh, traditional tattoos. So what is that? My mom, my, great gr my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, just three generations ago, um, we were wearing traditional tattoos. Uh, this is another picture of life in Kotzebue. These are my uncles, and some of you may know them. Their names are there. Annie is my Anna, and Pete, Ross, and Bobby are the babies in the little sled there. But I love this picture because it really demonstrates what life is like in Kotzebue still. You know, you're fish and processing and uh, gathering. Um, it's not an easy life. And then that brings me to my work, uh, artwork. Um, and I guess um, these prints especially were done on a Dutch Bible. Um, and they represent things that I feel religion maybe took from Native culture, and, and, and to pick me, the tattooing is also something that was taken from, from us by religion. Um, at the turn of the century, or the 1900s, most women had them, traditional tattoos, and with the introduction of religion, and then going forward, nobody had them. So it, it disappears quickly. I mean, we're trying to bring it back. There, there's more than just Maya and I trying to bring it back. But in general, religion and um, the westernization had a lot to do with the disappearance of traditional tattooing. And these were some images that inspired me over the years, um, images I've seen in books, at museums, um, that got me thinking tattooing. These are Siberian Yupik. I mean, these are just great images of tattoos on women. This one didn't turn out very well. But in your back tattooing, um, and I'm going to let Maya talk more about the technique and the technical side of it, but I kind of wanted to show you what 
uh, what inspired me. And then real quickly, I wanted to talk about how we came together. I kind of applied, well, I came to tattooing um, selfishly, traditional tattooing. I wanted a t traditional tattoo myself, and I couldn't find anyone to do it. Um, then it got me thinking, why don't I have anyone to do it? Shouldn't I be able to fly to Kotzebue or Uniclead or, I don't know, Barrow and, and get them done? And there was, there was no place to go for that. I could fly to Copenhagen and see Maya. But um, that got me thinking that we should have a program here. We should have something where Native women can learn skin stitching and hand poke tattoos. And then I should be able to go to them. There should be a, there's a market. There's a market for that here in Alaska. Um, so I approached the Polar Lab. I had this idea to put together a program. I didn't have an artist yet, which is, I, I knew they were out there, hopefully. Um, so the Polar Lab agreed to, uh, to this program. And I kind of put the word out that I wanted a traditional tattoo artist and Stephen Blanchett, who's just coming in the door. <laughs> <laughs> was traveling and living in Copenhagen, and he was at a music festival, and just by chance met Maya, and was back in town, and then came back to town and introduced us on Facebook. Sometimes Facebook can be so awful, but sometimes it can be really amazing. <laughs> and um, we started chatting about this idea, and she, I mean, I could tell right away that we had the same passion, the same drive to get something started here, and not just here, but, and we'll talk more about that, the Arctic regions. Um, and then before I knew it, I was planning and planning, and then she's here, this amazing artist um, who can help me bring this back. And I'm so proud and, and so thankful for the, for the museum's um, excitement and for you all being here and I get to uh, introduce my partner <laughs> in this program, and um, Maya Jacobson. Please welcome her. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my name is Maya Sieluk, and I am from Greenland. And I hope you can un understand what I'm saying. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, so, uh, I will start out with introducing myself, and as you can see, uh, this is me on, in the beautiful, festive uh, clothing. It is my confirmation. I am 14 years old in this picture, and I chose to use this picture for you guys uh, because that would have been the age where I most likely would start getting my tattoos. Um, the other picture is my Anana, my mother, and me. <laughs> um, my mother is from West Greenland. She's from Sisimut. Um, she did not get to grow up in Greenland. Like many other Greenlandic children, she was sent to Denmark. Um, at some point early in her life. She was eight or nine years old, I think. And uh, it broke her heart and her spirit. And uh, when she passed away, I decided to find a way to mend that. To sort of uh, make Native women strong and... and uh, meant those hearts, and the only way I know how is tattooing. And, um, yeah. So, this is motherland. <laughs> um, I, w I will walk over here and show you guys where I'm from. Um, I hope you can see it. Sisimut is where my mom is from. The big island is where I grew up. Uh, my dad brought me back to Greenland, and uh, I got to have a Greenlandic childhood in this town. <laughs> and sometimes we say that a picture is just a fragment of the truth, but this is it. <laughs> uh, 
there is nothing hiding behind. It's this is it. It's white snow and ice and yeah. <laughs> Our life there was uh, very traditional. There were bear hunters and seal hunters, and we were ocean people. And uh, my job, that's me and my friend, we had to fish for dog food every day. In my town, there was about 900 people uh, on, a, on a good day, maybe 1,000 when, when we were peaking, and uh, maybe 3,000 dogs, I guess. Uh, so it took a lot of dog food. <laughs> um, the traditional hunting is still going on, but it was way stronger in the 70s when I grew up. Here's a beautiful walrus. Yeah. Um, when I grew up in Greenland, uh, we didn't hear nothing about our tattoo traditions. Actually, I had no idea for the longest of times that, that my people used to get tattooed. And um, no one would ever have guessed that I would become a tattoo artist <laughs> and travel the world. That's insane. Um, but that did happen. I left Greenland when I was 16 years old, and I went to Denmark like people from Greenland do. Got my education, worked for a couple of years uh, faithfully to Greenland with tourism and like I was expected to do. And then I broke loose because it was not for me. And I started tattooing uh, when I was 32 years old. I'm not going to say how many years because then you can know how old I am. <laughs> it's a while. Um, <laughs> and after 10 years of uh, regular Western machine tattooing, I sort of um, decided, with a little help from my health, uh, that I was going to start hand poking instead of using the machines. All those 10 years, people had said to me, uh, why don't you dip into your own people's tattoos? Uh, and I thought, who am I going to tattoo stripes in the face on? I don't understand this. I, I, I was not ready for it. And um, I was so preoccupied learning tattooing, which takes a lot of years. Uh, but when I started hand poking, the whole process of my thinking changed. And uh, I thought, hmm, I would like to have some of those patterns to use in my daily work. And they were really hard to find. And um, that just made me even more curious. And I used a lot of time to uh, starting a research. Uh, I was researching uh, first Greenlandic tattoos. I was wondering how widespread was it? When did it stop? What do they mean? All this stuff, I was oblivious. And uh, I found some pretty amazing things. And um, we are now back on the island where I grew up. And I'm going to show you this peninsula here is called Nusuaq. And on the north part here, there is a place called Qilakitsuaq little sky and right there just maybe a week by dog sledding from my area kayaking in the summer short travel right there <laughs> yeah i think a week it's nothing in greenland and uh, <laughs> right there the mummies were found the mummies of krilakitsok and they had tattoos these are my girls. Um, the tattoos, um, well, first of all, we can only know that they have facial tattoos because the tattooing has never been important enough for the science that they would want to cut the clothing up and check their bodies. I would love them to do that, but they're not gonna. So we just know that they have facial tattoos. And I have been studying these tattoos like intensely. These mummies are my best friends. 
and I learned, if you notice the top picture here, you can actually see the stitching. And um, I didn't notice that to begin with. I was just, wow, they got tattoos. But like after I read the book the fifth time, I started <laughs> noticing new things. And uh, it has helped me to understand how to make these tattoos because there's absolutely no one I can ask. In order to make a tattoo, um, you need you need equipment and you need preparation and, and there's a lot of preparation before any type of tattoo. And to make a traditional Inuit tattoo, you would need the sinew. How does that start? You catch a whale and that's a big task in itself. And then you have to extract the sinew from the muscle and you have to make the thread and there's a lot of of course, it was also used for clothing, and, and women would always work on this constantly, constantly, constantly. Some still do. And uh, this thread was used for tattooing. I don't do that, uh, because I can't sterilize it. I need to be able to tattoo safely. Um, I would love to try it on myself, though. Maybe I will. My research, um, I have read so many books. Um, because of my schooling in Denmark, I can read all the Scandinavian languages and English and German and Dutch. And that has helped me to, to find a lot of material in various museums. And for every 100 pages I have read, there were maybe three sentences about tattooing and often they were nonsense and often they were the same like the other guy had written it's very homogenic the the information uh, so I just had to go further than that I had to go deeper I said who did these guys ask who did they the, the, these guys uh, were missionaries explorers uh, travelers you know um, scientists Western and male. And I figured that my advantage compared to these guys <laughs> is that I'm Inuk, I'm woman, and I'm a tattooist. So I will understand the tattoos in a whole different way. A lot of the tattoos are not, um, how do you say, There's, there are no pictures or drawings of them. They're just described with words. So I have had to draw all of them. It took a year. You won't believe how many there are. It's fantastic. And they were just laying in basements of museums. So I made this girl, this face here. I call her Anna Ruluk, little woman. I wanted her to represent everybody from Chukotka to East Greenland trying to hit a face that would sort of look like all of us. And uh, she has been traveling with me for some years now and uh, copied many times. That's why she's getting a little pale. But <laughs> <laughs> and she has been wearing all of the tattoos that I found. Mm. The chin tattoo seems to be the tattoo that most uh, of our women um, are attracted to initially. Um, it's also the tattoo that has the most stories around it. All the women seem to think then they know a little bit what it means and, and it, what it meant to them and to their grandmother or whatever. And, and it's so good for me to hear all of this because in Greenland there has been no tattooing since 1750 or something. There's no one I can ask. The chin tattoo is very significant. It was often the first tattoo in most areas. Um, and it had like this, uh, I'm, I'm ready for life. I'm ready for being a grown-up. Uh, I'm ready for marriage, if you want to use like such a modern Western term for the partnership people would have. It has 
it it can look in so many ways everything from from one stripe to 20 you know and i think uh, it was a little bit up to where you were from your group but it was also up to the lady who made it Inuit seems to be very fashion-minded somehow when you start studying them. It's very fascinating. These tattoos here are from the... I have divided people up, so I call them Central Inuit. Nowadays, people would call them Canadians. I'm trying to avoid those <laughs> divisions of people. Um, they are most likely very similar to what would be in my area, in Greenland, in West Greenland, that is. I can tell you a lot about every detail of the patterns, but we don't have time for that, I fear. <laughs> thank you, I will, thank you. I will try at least. Um, this one here, closest to me, uh, is one of the mummies from Rilakitsok. I just took the tattoo and put it on a real face instead of this curled up mummy face. And um, the one to the right is one of my, my right is one of my favorites. I find it so beautiful. Have you noticed um, the forehead tattoos? That is definitely a pattern you have seen before elsewhere. It is very often on the snip of our Anuak. Um, and they come in just as many shapes and forms as the snip of the Anuak. If there is a connection there, who knows? There's no one we can ask. These two are also uh, from Qilakitsoq. The five of the eight mummies had tattoos there. Four of them seem to have been made by the same person. And the last one was a little different. Maybe she was married into the group. And that is sort of a, a significant... Uh, you would get tattooed by someone close to you, uh, someone in your group, your mother, uh, aunt, an and elder woman, um, and she, of course, would be an excellent uh, seamstress, and uh, that's also who taught you sewing clothing. Um, I have a lot of Canadian stuff here in Greenlandic. <laughs> It's the same also, the last one. Oh, okay, no, that's fine, that's fine. The Yupik tattoos are a little different. Um, they are so fascinating to me um, because they are much more, I would almost say floral sometimes. Um, they have elements of patterns that we don't use in the rest of the Inuit world. And when I say Inuit world, it's just the ICC version of Inuit. It's Inupiaq, everybody. Um, um, but the, the, the Yupik is so incredibly intricate, and I'm still trying to learn to draw them right. Um, amazingly beautiful. Uh, I might get myself a Yupik tattoo. <laughs> I will give you back Holly. <laughs> so Maya mentioned, um, we've been doing a lot of talking since she's been here about this idea of the Arctic people. And I was here uh, for Sonia's um, curated conversation on Friday, and she had her father come up, and he's an ICC president for Alaska, and he mentioned uh, something that rang with us, and we've been talking about, is that the people, um, what Maya said, the people of this region, the Arctic region, the Inuit people, Inuit people, Inupak people, um, 
he thinks of as one person. And actually, when you when we're together, we're from different parts of the world. You can see Nome there on the map and Greenland. It's a long ways to go, but the language is the same. There's a little difference in pronunciation when we talk, but um, the language is exactly the same. So um, we've talked a lot about that, about being one people and bringing something back. And the goal for this program, the Tupikmi program, is what Maya was talking about, this idea to empower Native women, Native girls um, in life uh, to know their place both um, in the community, but to, to, to be proud of being Inuit, to be proud of being Inupac. Um, and uh, Jimmy's comment about being one people, it rang so true with us when we finally met face to face. Um, yeah, so we've been doing a lot of talking about that, a lot of talking about how we're going to connect to people in the community, uh, what the next year's program is going to look like. The plan with this program, this year is kind of an introduction to Maya and what we are going to do. Um, the next year, we would like to select some artists who uh, could do this work and learn from Maya. And then those people, hopefully, if we select the right people, we'll then teach other people in, in the Inupac women to skin stitch and hand poke, and it will create something here that we don't have. 